So I welcome everybody to this session of the Raising Peace Festival 2024 in the lead up to the UN Day of Peace on the 21st of September. My name is Vishuringa and I'm part of the Raising Peace organizing group. I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land where each of us is. And I would like to acknowledge the Wola medical people uh, of this region in the right area of Sydney. And I'd like to acknowledge their care for the natural environment, the fauna, the flora, and the waterways. And I acknowledge their elders past, present, and emerging. This session is called Stepping Back from the Brink. The world is now arguably closer to nuclear war than it has ever been. What happens if we go over the edge? How do we step back? So that is the theme of this afternoon's session. We have three eminent speakers for this session. John Hallam, Tillman Ruff, and Aaron Tovich. And John Hallam and Aaron are together on the screen at the People for Nuclear Disarmament Office. And Tillman Ruff will be coming in. He said he might be running late, but that he expected to be here by 3.30. So we'll expect him uh, any time. I will introduce each of the speakers with a few sentences before they speak. Then there will be a Q&A at about 4.30 after the speakers have finished. And as attendees, you can put your questions in the chat and we will monitor those questions. So if you have any questions that come up, please put them in the chat. Yes, I'll be um, monitoring the chat for any questions and um, I'll let the speakers know. Um, Good. Thanks, Paloma. Paloma is our uh, Zoom host uh, and she'll uh, let people in and so on. Uh, so the first speaker is John Hallam uh, and he will speak on the topic of stating the problem. John is part of People for Nuclear Disarmament and a UN nuclear disarmament campaigner. He's been involved in nuclear disarmament and risk reduction at the UN since 2006. He's co-convener of the Abolition 2000 Nuclear Risk Reduction Working Group and the Global No First Use Campaign. John will speak for 12 minutes and then uh, the next speaker will be Tillman Ruff. So we'll go uh, with John. Your 12 minutes have started. Well, um, in the United Nations, I get seven minutes. And I generally begin my seven minutes by saying this year is the riskiest year that ever was. Um, and I think that that has been true basically since about 2011. Each year has become incrementally more and more risky. And um, there's a number of things that have contributed to make that. But this year and the year immediately preceding it and the year before that, so uh, 2022, 23, 24, um, has to take the, the cake, um, has to be the most risky time for the longest time that has ever been and that includes the heights and depths of the Cold War and includes the Cuban Missile Crisis. Now, there were a number of occasions during the Cuban Missile Crisis, and some of these Aaron is exceedingly well aware of, um, in which we came terribly, terribly close to the apocalypse. Um, there was the there was the occasion with the the submarine that was being depth charged, and there was some frightening things happening with nuclear tipped um, nuclear tipped cruise missiles in Okinawa. But still, the Cuban Missile Crisis per se lasted for thirteen days. We have been in a state of elevated risk now for years. Um, and these risks took a sharp upward turn 
um, with Vladimir Putin's announcement um, that if you stop us um, doing, or if you try to stop us doing what we are trying to do in Ukraine, and the Ukrainians themselves managed to stop them um, in any way, that's, that's another thing. Um, if you try to stop us, you will experience consequences that you have never experienced before in your history. And this was a sort of an implicit, and it was followed two days later by a very, very public placing of, um, of, of Russia's nuclear forces on high alert. Now, exactly what the high alert meant in technical terms is a bit vague, but it was clearly a form of signalling that we are ready to go over the brink. Now, since that time, um, a nuclear threat, um, an explicit nuclear threat um, from either Vladimir Putin or Putin's double, if he's a double, um, or from Lavrov or Medvedev um, or Margarita Simonyan um, or Solovyev, um, all dutifully broadcast by Russian State TV, um, is almost a weekly occurrence. And we are becoming a bit sort of inured to it. But throughout the entire time of the Cold War, these things did not happen. The nearest that Khrushchev got um, was, we will bury you. Now, it's true that on the US side, we had on the one hand, um, Senator Strom Thurmond back in 1983, this is one of my favourites, obviously, um, saying to a reporter, the righteous will be raptured to heaven. But no one echoed it. It did not become official US policy that the righteous will be raptured to heaven. It was a piece of theologizing by a guy who did happen to be for 20 years chair of a Senate Select Committee on Foreign Affairs and Defense, so not uninfluential. But it wasn't official US policy. It wasn't the president saying, you will become toast. Um, but we have had that and we are continuing to have it. And even if you argue, as many do, as, as I hope and pray is indeed true, um, that this is bluff, that, um, that, that it's not really meant, that those who have their fingers on literal and metaphorical buttons in Russia um, are fully aware of the cataclysmic risks that they run. Even if you argue that, all of this puts militaries on both sides into a state of high alert um, in which mistakes are frighteningly possible. And again, if you cast your eye back over the mistakes that were made during the Cold War, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, we are bloody lucky to be. So I guess um, what I would want to suggest is that the risk of a civilization ending event sequence are as high as they have ever been in the whole of history, including during the highest, most dangerous points of the Cold War. Now, the other problem is that no one seems to have noticed, or very few people seem to have noticed. Yes, wonks like myself, Aaron, people who people who do analysis of um, nuclear posture are very well aware of it. Um, but there is there's very little understanding out there amongst activists, amongst peace activists in the public of just how extreme is the situation in which we now find ourselves. 
and I'm hoping um, that Tillman will tell us what happens if someone makes the final mistake and takes us over the edge. Perhaps I'll, I'll conclude with just a little, um, a little reminder that to end what we call high-tech civilization doesn't necessarily take thousands and thousands of warheads. Contemporary capitalism would be ended if as few as five not necessarily very big warheads optimised for the production of gamma rays were to be exploded in space four to five hundred kilometres out in space above the approximate geometric centres of continental land masses. Every screen goes blank and everything stops. It's a quick trip back to the 18th century, a trip which, in the words of a US congressional commission that looked at it, 90% of Americans would not survive, and we can assume, we can extrapolate from that, 90% of Australians and Europeans and Japanese and probably also Chinese and Indians would also not survive it. We are so hooked into an electronic infrastructure that we would hardly survive the destruction of that. Um, what happens after, um, after those warheads have been launched after the four or five thousand that Russia is capable of launching, the three to four thousand that the United States is capable of launching is another matter. Um, it's a major glitch on the planet's evolutionary progress to end it mildly. Uh, I'm sure my time must have expired. It's coming very close, but you've done well, John. Thank you. I've heard John speak before, and once he's on a roll, he's on a roll. So thank you for finishing. And Tillman hasn't arrived yet. So Aaron, I think you would be then the next speaker. And I'll just do a little intro for you uh, so that uh, our audience knows where you're coming from. And I understand that you will uh, speak on your work as a lobbyist in anti-nuclear work. Aaron has been active as a lobbyist in organizations at the UN and with European organizations since the 1980s. Most recently, he has been campaign director with the global organization of Mayors for Peace. Mayors for Peace was started by the mayor of Hiroshima in 1982. When mayors of cities sign on, and more than 8,000 have, it means they support negotiations to abolish nuclear weapons. Aaron is currently senior advisor to the No First Use campaign and a co-convener of the Abolition 2000 Nuclear Risk Reduction Working Group. Aaron, if you'd like to speak, then uh, if you can start, then we'll, uh, and then when Tillman comes in, he will speak after you. Thank you. Well, thank you for that introduction. Uh, I've now been for the first time in Australia for about eight days. And it's been a wonderful experience uh, of a purely tourist nat uh, nature. And now I am very pleased to have an opportunity to uh, talk politics and nuclear weapons. Um, the, uh, in case Tillman doesn't make it, I'll just make one slight uh, comment on uh, John's uh, presentation. He mentioned hundreds and thousands of nuclear weapons but I think it, uh, he would agree that uh, even if only 20 of the larger nuclear weapons were targeted against 20 larger metropolises, we're in really bad shape. Uh, yeah, you're talking about one, two, three billion people dying of starvation in the following one, two or three years. Um, uh, it's called nuclear winter. Um, and uh, the science behind it has only gotten stronger and stronger uh, since it was introduced uh, several decades ago. 
So um, with that in mind, <laughs> uh, I'm going to focus on, well, let me put it this way. I have worked a long time on this issue, as the introduction made clear. And in some sense, I feel I have been spinning my wheels. And I feel most of us, the movement as a whole, has been spinning its wheels. Um, we have gotten some things accomplished, and then we see them undone. Now is a, we're in the midst of a period of more undoing. Uh, and we've been chasing uh, the goal of arms reductions, of disarmament, doggedly. Uh, we did achieve a comprehensive test ban, and that's, I'm proud of my contributions to that achievement, which I'm happy to talk more about. But my focus now is on how we perhaps need to have a serious reevaluation of how we've been moving against the nuclear threat. And I'm going to step back in history briefly to look at how the threat of chemical and germ warfare or biological warfare, if you will, uh, was addressed by the world. And this may all seem very archaic and, and uh, not to the point, but I'll show you what the relevance of this is. After World War I, in which both chemical and biological weapons were used, um, the horror of what had happened to the soldiers and to civilians who were caught along the front lines uh, was evident to all sides. Um, and within seven years, uh, particularly with the initiative coming from France, the uh, a thing called the Geneva Protocols were signed uh, eventually by pretty much all of the major powers, or at least acknowledged by all of the major powers, which said that you shouldn't use these things. They didn't try to disarm. They didn't try to reduce. They just said, we agree not to use these things against each other. Um, and that maybe sounds like a, a rather vague and, you know, uh, easily overturned thing, but it was recognized by all concerned that starting, restarting the use of either of these weapons would only lead to um, horrors again for everybody. And this understanding held up even during the darkest days of World War II. And at the end of, uh, of, the, of World War II, and for several decades later, it continued to hold and it provided the basis for the negotiations of the prohibition of chemical weapons and biological weapons, which are now in force. Um, and um, a large um, chemical weapons uh, verification agency, uh, I'll get the initials right. Um, Not the OPCW. The OPCW, thank you, John. Um, I was gonna say OPEC. <laughs> <laughs> the OPCW in The Hague is uh, deeply involved in uh, the verification and monitoring of the chemical weapon, uh, weapons pro prohibition, the convention. So the progression there was prohibiting use and then prohibiting the weapon itself. Now, why didn't we take this approach to nuclear weapons? Well, very quickly, we got snookered by history because um, the understanding of the potential for a sustained chain reaction leading to a massive uh, and powerful explosion wasn't appreciated until after the Geneva Protocols had been negotiated. And the way that that could be done wasn't recognized until just a year before uh, war broke out in Europe. 
If it had been realized earlier, it almost certainly would have been in, uh, included in the Geneva Protocol. End of discussion. No one would have uh, been building nuclear weapons with the intention of using them. Um, if it had been discovered a year later, there wouldn't have been time for the Manhattan Project to develop them. And then when people realized uh, what the potential was, it would have also been considered uh, inadmissible for use. I use that word because it's only in the last few years that the international community has explicitly said that the use or threat of use of nuclear weapons is inadmissible. Um, Lavrov and Putin and several of the other nuclear weapon state leaders said that in Bali. They reiterated it in New Delhi, and it has now been taken up by the NPT states parties at the last PrepCom. It's very important. What inadmissible means is that there's things that you can do which are acceptable on a civilized basis, and there are things that you sh should never do because they're unacceptable on a civilized basis. They're barbaric. So saying that the use or threat of the use of nuclear weapons is basically saying, if you do that stuff, you are setting yourself outside civilization, you are acting like a barbarian. That's an important stance. Unfortunately, as John described, there is a leader in Russia and cohorts around him who think it's perfectly fine. But let's go further. It has been the policy of NATO that it can initiate nuclear war if a conventional war isn't going the way they like. And it's been that policy since it was founded. When it was founded, it at least had some strategic sense to it because Russia did not have nuclear weapons. And for them to send a conventional force against a nuclear armed force uh, would have been suicidal for them. But by the 1960s, Russia had a nuclear arsenal that was comparable to the Americans. And from that point on, the threat of starting a nuclear war simply no longer made sense for anybody. But unfortunately, by then, that pledge of the US to resort to nuclear weapons if an ally was in really deep trouble became what they called the glue of the NATO alliance. And to take that away would mean the alliance would fall apart, which of course is nonsense, but it's repeated over and over and over again as a justification for first use policies. Um, so I believe strongly, and uh, John, I know, <laughs> concurs strongly with it as well, that we need to address not just the number of weapons or the type of weapons or uh, the expense but, of the weapons. But, but youth policies we need, what is going, why, what use are these weapons meant to serve? Does, does, that, does it make any sense that, that this or that particular use? Now, one could make the case that as a retaliation in kind, nuclear weapons maybe serve a purpose of, of, of uh, dissuading someone from starting a nuclear war. Um, but to actually have a policy that you would initiate nuclear war simply doesn't make sense. And we can drive that home to the point where NATO will change its policy, where the US will change its policy, and the other nuclear weapon states will come along except for two of them that already have that policy. China, Namely China and yeah. India. China has had that policy since it first tested a nuclear weapon, and India has had that policy since it first or second tested a nuclear weapon. Um, and has their deterrence been any worse or less effective than the countries that have first use policies? No, because the first use policies aren't credible. You start a nuclear war, you get a nuclear war in response. What have you accomplished? Nothing, nothing whatsoever. It's just like using germ and gas warfare. You don't accomplish anything. So 
Putin is bluffing, I believe, completely. NATO is bluffing, but they don't call each other's bluff because it makes them look tough. It makes them look uh, more powerful than everybody else. And everybody shakes in their boots a bit. Well, we need to call their bluffs. We need to get those policies changed. And I think if we give priority to this, I'm not saying don't talk about disarmament anymore, but I'm saying until we sort this out, we're gonna go round and round in circles on disarmament because ultimately they have said that we will keep our nuclear weapons even if everyone else gets rid of them because we need them to deal with a conventional threat. Take that in. So let's give high priority to no first use from now on until we achieve no first use policies and then other risk reductions, other uh, number reductions, other expenditure reductions, those will follow quite naturally. Uh, I mean, we'll have to keep at it. We gotta you know, hold the feet to the fire, but we will make progress in those areas once we have established that nobody can or should initiate a nuclear war. I guess I've said my piece, thanks. Yeah, thank you, Aaron. Thank you very much. It's a complex matter, a uh, complex topic and a lot of acronyms. Um, and thank you for that, but I can't see Tillman yet. So he must be stuck somewhere in traffic. Um, and I wonder if there are any questions about just to clarify what John and Aaron have said. They, well, yeah. I, I, I wanted to, to mention that um, Aaron and I have been the, I don't know if you would call it the terrible twins or whatever, um, globally um, in that we above any other activists that I'm aware of, with the possible exception of Daryl Kimball in the United States, in Washington, um, have been pushing for change, not only in having nuclear weapons, not only for change in numbers, but for change in nuclear posture and nuclear policy and in the admissibility of use of nuclear weapons at all. Um, and this has particularly been so in the last five years, I think. Um, we've been the people who, um, with, the, um, with, with, with the assistance of quite a number of other activists who've come in, as it were, on our coattails, and particularly mentioning Alan Ware, um, but also Bill King from the Parliamentary Network for Nuclear Non-Proliferation and Disarmament, um, who have fronted up to diplomats in the UN and said, we would like to see a reiteration of the G20 statement on um, on inadmissibility of nuclear weapons use um, by the General Assembly. Um, we would like to see a reiteration of Reagan Gorbachev. And I mean, certainly in, in, in my case, that, that came out of um, a history since 2006 of talking about nuclear weapons posture. So that's whether, whether you have your nuclear weapons able to be launched in seconds or whether you keep them in a kind of recessed posture um, as a means of reducing the risk of an accidental nuclear war. So no, I mean, can I just what? stop you mid-flight? And I just wondered if uh, both of both of you belong to the Abolition 2000 Nuclear Risk Reduction Working Group. Aaron, could you talk yes. a little bit more about that? Yes, what what that is? Yeah, sure. Um, we've seen that the nuclear disarmament process um, is prolonged. Let's put it that way. Um, may, hopefully, not as long as it. Uh, 
um, needs to be. Um, but so while that process is gaining traction with the help of a no first use uh, approach, um, we need to reduce the risk of accidental nuclear war, inadvertent nuclear war, unauthorized nuclear war, um, and uh, the risk reduction working group has um, held uh, workshops, uh, discussions with diplomats, with military people um, on these topics, uh, including the de-alerting of nuclear missiles, which are currently primed to be uh, used within uh, 15 minutes of the detection of, of, of an excuse or a reason for using the weapons. Um, and uh, the uh, uh, there are many aspects of how nuclear weapons are deployed and maintained, uh, which uh, lead to greater risk uh, that they will be used even if a government uh, didn't doesn't really actually want to use them. Um, and there are some specific examples of that. Um, uh, uh, I uh, believe uh, one we've is... got Tillman Ruff that has yeah. just joined. Sorry to put in. Aaron to finish but I have this in sure. let yeah. you know. Sorry about butting in, Aaron. Yeah. Oh, by all means, over to you, Tillman. Uh, Tillman, thank you very much that you have been able to join us. Um, both John and Aaron have spoken uh, and more painted a picture also historically of where uh, yeah, the nuclear disarmament uh, process is at. And a later on question I would like to ask all three of you is, where are the bright spot, where, spots? Where is there some progress? Because we don't want to come out of this webinar saying it's all too late, forget about it, take to the hills because it's all, you know, we're in a very bad shape. Uh, what can each of us do? But Tillman, you were going to ask, talk, yeah, it's more bad news about nuclear winter, but also especially about the TP, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Um, so if you could speak to those two topics for about 12 minutes, then uh, we can go over to some more questions and comments from the chat. So thank you very much for getting here in a hurry. Well, thanks very much for having me. And my humble apologies for, for, for being so late. I had a medical thing on the other side of town that I really couldn't change. Um, so I'm sorry I've missed the um, the earlier part of the discussion. I forgot to do the introduction to you. Oh, that's all right. Oh, <laughs> but, but, well, I think that is important for our audience to know who you are. Because Associate Professor Tillman Ruff, AO, has a long CV of achievements. Just to highlight a few, he's an honorary infectious diseases and public health physician at the University of Melbourne. He's a co-founder of ICANN, the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, and that's the organization that received the Nobel Peace Prize in 2017. And by the way, Tillman received the Nobel Peace Prize in his own right in 1985. So I don't think there's anybody else around who has two Nobel Peace Prizes. He's been part of the campaign for the UN Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons for decades. So that was my quick introduction for you, Tillman. Well, that's very kind of you. The, uh, just to a small historical correction, the, the Nobel Peace Prize in 1985 belongs to international physicians for the prevention of nuclear war, of which I was an active member, but uh, it's not uh, in any sense mine personally. It's shared very widely. Um, so thanks very much. So yeah, my brief was really to, to I guess, outline what I think is the most crucial new ev newish evidence um, around why it's so urgent and essential that we control the nuclear risk and eliminate nuclear weapons, and then talk about the treaty and and Australia's uh, position on on, on that. Um, I'll just share my screen show you some slides. So I hope you can um, you can see that. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Great. So I'll just get stuck into it. Um, Aaron and John have already probably talked about the the great level of risk, the really unprecedented uh, level of risk um, that's currently assessed um, for nuclear war from both the Doomsday Clock uh, custodians, the UN Secretary General, and 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 pretty much most other authoritative um, sources. WHO concluded when it examined the evidence about the impacts of nuclear weapons decades ago, really even before the nuclear winter science or just as the nuclear winter science was, was coming to light, that nuclear weapons constituted the greatest immediate threat to health and welfare. So it's not as if the other impacts of nuclear weapons are in any way lesser or, or, or more acceptable or, or less an existential threat. But but I think this really does change change the game. Um, and WHO made abundantly clear that no combination of health and emergency services worldwide could respond to the effects of even a single urban nuclear detonation. Um, but the weapons that destroyed Hiroshima and, and Nagasaki um, 79 years ago, really only, they're really important historical lessons to understand but they really don't give us an accurate picture of what a modern nuclear war would would be would be like, and it's really the climate um, that emerges as the central element. And then, and I think one really not yet adequately um, understood reality of our time is that the hospitable and stable climate we need for human and ecosystem flourishing really needs to be protected from both uncontrolled heating, as, as pretty much everyone alive will realise by now, um, but also from the abrupt ice age conditions that would result from even pretty modest in nuclear terms um, use of, of even a small fraction of the global nuclear arsenal. So, so how does that work? It's because nuclear weapons are extraordinarily efficient incendiary devices so over a very large area, nuclear weapons will ignite fires that will coalesce and essentially burn everything flammable. Um, wood, vegetation, most waste, plastics, oil products, uh, essentially much of the urban infrastructure. Um, it's estimated that even the relatively small, by today's standards, you know, hardly bigger than the smallest Russian tactical nuclear weapon, Hiroshima bomb, released about a thousand times as much energy in the fires that it ignited um, as the already substantial explosive power of the weapon. So that'll give you some sense just, just as to how much this can magnify um, the blast and other impacts of the weapons, which are already horrendous enough. On, on the left is that mushroom cloud from the direct um, airburst that was the Hiroshima bomb. Several hours later, you've got this much larger uh, cloud rising up to the top of the the range of the atmosphere where the weather is um, hours later from from all of the smoke and you can see the the difference in in scale so in Hiroshima about 13 square kilometers of the city were comprehensively um, burned um, the largest currently deployed nuclear weapons are in China they're about five megatons um, that would burn not 13 square kilometres, but about 1,600 square kilometres, really comprehensively, over 800 degrees, consuming most of the oxygen, killing essentially everything living. Um, that in a city like, well, in any major city, involves a radius of about 23 kilometres um, in every direction. Um, so if you're familiar with Melbourne, that's from out past the airport to... Doncaster, nearly down to Seaford. Um, it, it's a vast uh, area of most that would accommodate all but the largest of, of cities. Um, so the scenario that's been most widely studied really as a plausible example, there's nothing unique about the scenario itself, is uh, a 250 bomb scenario involving an India-Pakistan war. Um, and I'm going to pick the the date of exists for 15, so Hiroshima size and bigger, I'm going to pick the middle one, 50 kilotons, because I think that's probably a sort of an average um, representative scenario. That would clearly cause horrendous casualties uh, across 
South Asia, but it would also yield, depending on the size of the weapons, between about 15 and 40 million tonnes of sooty black smoke. This is in numbers less than 2% of the global nuclear arsenal and less than 1% of its yield because the average size of weapon in the global arsenal is about 160 kilotons, so three times that size. So in nuclear terms, this is a relatively modest uh, nuclear war. And just to compare, um, you know, what a serious nuclear war involving Russia and the United States arsenals, still 90% of the world's nuclear weapons would involve, you know, just one a higher class submarine that the US operates 14 of contains um, about twice the destructive capacity of the arsenals of India, Pakistan and Israel combined uh, in one submarine. So in nuclear war terms, this is by no means an extreme scenario. So, But the smoke spreads quite quickly from burning cities in South Asia. Within about a fortnight, it will cover pretty much all of the uh, the land areas of the globe and then just basically sit around for a very long time and be lofted very high into the atmosphere. So looked at another way is if you took a cross section through the atmosphere, South Pole on the left, North Pole on the right, equator in the middle, the troposphere, this is the range of the atmosphere, the lower sort of 10 to 15 kilometres where weather happens, snow and rain and clouds are down here. Once particulate material gets up into the stratosphere or beyond, it just settles slowly by gravity, very long residence time. So it hangs around for very much longer. So because it's black, it also gets very hot. So the smoke will get about 50 to 80 degrees hotter up in the upper atmosphere. So I'll just show you how quickly that smoke, um, the time frame is so fast, it's hard to, to see it happen. I'll just go, go back, sorry. Um, so it, it starts on the 1st of January, the time, the counter at the top. And within a couple of days, it's most of the smoke is essentially up in the, the stratosphere and beyond. So with and will persist there for about a about a decade or more. The black line is the one I want you to follow. That's the uh, those 250 50 kiloton weapons. So this is what happens versus time for rainfall on the left and global average surface temperature on the, on the right. Um, you can see rainfall drops by around 25-30% at its peak, uh, several years after such a war. This purple bar is the range of, of minimum temperature. So how, how much colder than present was it at the peak of the last ice age about 20,000 years ago? This is the current temperature up here. Um, and you can see that it was between three and eight degrees colder. Well, that relatively small nuclear war in one part of the world would get us down well into that ice age range when ice covered most of the land masses of the northern hemisphere um, and we lived in a very different world and, and this was really pre-agriculture um, so ice age conditions essentially vary quickly over a period of several years not evenly distributed this is the temperature decline um, by global region and you can see that in the big land masses where most of the world's um, grain is grown, um, Eurasia and North America, it gets a lot colder than that average. Um, so 10 to 15 degrees colder, less so in the Southern Hemisphere. And precipitation also drops quite precipitously, um, averages roughly three uh, or one after two meters a, uh, millimeters a day. So it drops quite a lot and particularly marked in our part of the world in South and Southeast Asia. Um, so the drop in primary productivity, so all that plants produce that they don't need for their own growth, um, would be roughly comparable to all of the food and fibre that humans currently consume. It's, it's a really dramatic decline in the productivity of, of ecosystems. Um, and the biggest impacts are in the places that are cold already, where, where agriculture is already limited by temperature. So this is a, a, a scenario for, for corn. Um, and you can see that there's basically no corn growable in northern US, Canada, across most of northern Europe and Russia, um, parts of China, Korea, uh, Japan. Um, so disproportionate um, impacts in, in higher 
latitude regions. So the most recent data, and if you were going to read one scientific paper on this, I would recommend this one by Lily Jiar and her colleagues, published in Nature Food about two years ago now, that updated the scenarios that they had previously published and, and produced estimates of declines in food production for almost every country. Um, it's the only such detailed work that's that's ever been been done. It's quite an extraordinary scientific effort. But you can see, depending on the size of the weapons for an India-Pakistan war, um, this was the scenario, the middle one that we were looking at, horrible direct fatalities, but about 14, 15 times as many people would be dead from starvation globally by the end of the second year of such a war um, than would be direct uh, casualties and and for a larger nuclear war involving 150 um, million tons of of smoke, um, about four and a half thousand weapons of Russia and the U.S. used only about uh, way less than their whole arsenal. Um, you're talking about most of humanity. So these studies were done using data when there were about 6.7 billion people in the world. Um, so more than five billion of them would starve to death. Uh, by the end of year two. And as I showed you, the effects won't finish then. Um, these are very conservative estimates, but you can see there just how stark. This is the India's 50 kiloton weapon, India's Pakistan scenario I showed you. More than, I hope this thing's not in the way on your screen. I'll just try and move it. Um, you can see that more than three quarters of people in Canada, much of Northern Europe, Russia, Mongolia, Japan, Korea's, um, are starving by the end of year two and more than half of the population of China. Um, really extraordinary. And for the Russia-US scenario, most of the world, uh, a very high proportion of people are starving with the, some exceptions in the, in the Southern Hemisphere. Sorry, why isn't this going on? So, but and these are really conservative estimates that really just consider colder, darker, drier. What does that do? Um, that leave out all of the complex disruptions to agriculture, inputs of seed, fuel, fertilizer, um, transport, um, the distribution and storage of food, soil that would be lost from radioactive contamination from useful production, um, and the very much higher UV levels that would result from all that hot black smoke in the stratosphere breaking down the ozone that protects us. So. So this is very much a, a conservative scenario. Um, I'll skip that. I sort of said that. And the more areas that are researched, the more new evidence emerges, essentially all pointing in the direction that the, the, the more we know, the worse it looks. Um, marine ecosystems hadn't been widely previously studied, and, and the, um, this has been picked up in recent years, discovering all sorts of new phenomena, a, a really severe um, El Nino type ocean circulation that disrupts um, productivity in the Pacific Ocean, um, major changes in sea ice and ocean nutrients and circulations um, that would see, for example, most of the ports in Japan and Korea in the Northern Hemisphere completely ice bound, uh, essentially all year round. Um, impacts that haven't previously been documented, um, major declines in fisheries and ocean nutrients and, and persisting for probably centuries. Um, so some of the key scientists involved have really, um, you know, drawn the conclusion that these are not weapons in any meaningful sense. These are essentially global suicide bombs that simply can't be used. So um, have I got a little bit more time? Can I say a few things about the yeah. treaty? Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. the treaty come, doesn't come from nowhere. Um, our collective organization the the united nations founded in the aftermath of the of the most severe war in history to to try and prevent future wars its very first resolution in january 1946 called for the elimination of of atomic weapons this has been on the the highest priority for peace and security and disarmament from the international community since the un was founded um the treaty that almost all the world states have joined on to that's sort of regarded as the cornerstone in this area enshrines a binding obligation on all its members, not just the five nuclear weapons states under the treaty, but all of them 
uh, to get serious about disarmament. Um, and the International Court of Justice ha has advised that if it's illegal to use a weapon, then it's also illegal to threaten its use. Um, and also made it clear that that, that that obligation was one not of process, but of result. Um, that the obligation was not just to negotiate in good faith, but actually to achieve nuclear disarmament. And the lesson of history is that for all of the other major types of indiscriminate and inhumane weapons, um, where we've made much better progress than in relation to nuclear weapons, um, a treaty that has codified their rejection and provided for their elimination has been absolutely crucial. And indeed, we haven't controlled a weapon for which an international treaty of an instrument of prohibition um, and elimination hasn't existed. Um, and it's pretty logical, you know, codify their, that these weapons are beyond the pale provides a clear political, legal, moral standard for all states that then justifies and provides the basis and motivation for the progressive efforts to eliminate them. But until the TPNW, this hadn't been, this entirely logical um, approach hadn't been applied to nuclear weapons uh, because the nuclear armed states didn't want it. Otherwise, it would have, they would have been made illegal in the Geneva Conventions. Um, the TPNW now has just shy of half the world's states signed up. We hope that with Indonesia and Sierra Leone at least depositing their instruments of ratification on probably the 24th of September, um, that that will tip us to half the world. Um, and Indonesia will be the biggest state by population to, to be a state party to the treaty. So that's good news. It's slower progress than one would like, um, but it's progress nevertheless, still in, in the face of significant opposition. And it really is a a historic document. If you haven't read it, I'd really commend it to you. It's very short. Um, it really recognises the evidence about what the weapons would do. Uh, lots of recognitions for the first time, the disproportionate impacts on women and girls, on Indigenous people, uh, for example. Um, it does provide a pretty categorical and comprehensive prohibition that's pretty firmly modelled on the Chemical Weapons Convention. And it provides the only codified in an international treaty pathway framework for nuclear armed states to eliminate their weapons. There is no other pathway outlined. It's, it's of course, a framework because none of the nuclear armed states participated in the negotiation of this treaty and it would have been exceeded the mandate and been not feasible to. Um, but a very robust framework is there for time-bound uh, processes to eliminate not just the weapons, but the facilities and programs that produce them, subject to a subsequently very high level of safeguards and subject to international verification. And it also, in the nuclear field, has for the first time the so-called positive obligations that the landmines and cluster munitions treaties have to provide for the victims um, and to help remediate contaminated environments by nuclear use and testing. So it's a pretty you know, historic treaty uh, for the world's worst weapons of mass destruction. Um, what difference is it making? Apart from the numbers, I think you could say that um, there's certainly been a lot more statements on the unacceptability of nuclear threats from some unexpected quarters um, in recent years, the G20, the Secretary General of NATO, for example. Um, clear proof, highly relevant for Australia, that um, an alliance and military cooperation with a nuclear armed state um, is entirely compatible with treaty membership as Philippines, New Zealand and Thailand in our region have already amply demonstrated. And the Philippines in particular ramping up its, its military cooperation with the US quite substantially, completely unimpeded by the fact that, um, that it's, it's, a, it's ratified the treaty because its cooperation doesn't involve nuclear activities. Um, it's helping to drive divestment. So the number of financial institutions divesting from investing in nuclear weapons manufacturers is, is steadily increasing. It is, it's well over 100 now, some of the world's largest financial institutions, um, the world's largest sovereign wealth fund and so forth. Contrary to, to criticism that it weakens safeguards, it's actually strengthened safeguards. And there's been a couple of states that have been stimulated to, to strengthen or, or initiate new safeguards agreements on the basis of their obligations under the treaty.
and it's working incredibly collegially and effectively um, to implement the treaty and promote it. And it has the only scientific advisory group that any multilateral disarmament process um, has. Um, and the process of getting there was was really significant. Um, and that's one reason, I think, why the nuclear armed states really don't like it. Um, they couldn't stop this because the General Assembly was used to negotiate it. And the UNGA, unlike the Conference on Disarmament or the NPT, is not bound by the uh, consensus rule and can make substantive decisions by majority vote when um, if consensus can't be reached. So it really brought democracy and humanity to nuclear disarmament in a way that really hadn't happened in any other negotiation in, in, in recent times. Um, in Australia, there's a, a very strongly bipartisan history of joining weapons control treaties. I've, I've summarised most of them here. Ones that the coalition signed on the left, ratified on the right in blue, and ones that Labor signed or ratified um, on in red. Uh, the coalition's been in government for longer in the post-war period than, than Labor, but you can see that it's very evenly spread. And sometimes... You know, one party has signed, the others ratified, and, and in the odd instance, vice versa. And particularly for the prohibition treaties, so for biological and chemical weapons, landmines and cluster munitions, so if you count eight episodes of signature and ratification for those four treaties, it's exactly an even split, four and four, four coalition, four Labor. So presenting this as if it was somehow a partisan issue is completely contrary to the history of, of Australia's um, treaty processes around arms control and disarmament. And so the, the partisan nature of the TPNW in Australia is really, is really an anomaly. Of course, we have the, uh, the tantalising prospect that Labor and its national policy platform committed in 2018, moved by Albanese, seconded by Richard Miles, unanimously accepted, didn't go to a vote, uh, a commitment that Labor and government would sign and ratify the treaty. And they've confirmed that policy at the two subsequent national conferences since. What have they done? Um, not much. Small steps. Um, they've sent an observer to each of the meetings of states' parties. They've changed uh, um, their voting on a UN General Assembly resolution from no to abstain um, that supports the treaty. They've said some more positive things about it um, and they've strengthened the policy, not weakened it, um, and they haven't repudiated it. So on paper, we should we should be on the way. What's the, what's the reason for delay? And... The tantalising prospect is that Australia is the only nuclear allied state that has a government where the governing party has a national policy platform to join the treaty. So we really should be the first uh, nuclear allied state to join the TPNW if governments did what they said they'd do. The problem is that, that at present, Australia is actually adding obstacles to joining the TPNW faster than it's taking steps in that direction. Um, the extraordinarily diverse and escalating enmeshment of Australia in US military operations as a forward base for operations to, to contain and confront China, including uh, uh, nuclear dimensions, has been rapidly escalating with upgrades to bases, with um, plans to have on essentially permanent rotation, which really doesn't can't be anything other than stationing um, potentially nuclear capable aircraft here. Um, so if, as the government says, its acquisition of nuclear powered submarines is nothing to do with nuclear weapons, then by far the, the best, the most enduring and effective way to bind this and future governments to keep uh, Australia non-nuclear um, would be to join the TPNW. Um, but so far, that argument hasn't clearly hasn't cut through, and the problem is that there are that there is very significant obstacles being put in the way, and very significant American pressure uh, for Australia to be a forward operations base. The B fifty two stationing at Tyndall is potentially extremely significant because if the government sticks to its policy 
of either not asking um, whether those the aircraft coming here are nuclear capable or not, or and accepting the US policy of neither confirming or denying that, then about half the the B-52 fleet is nuclear capable. Um, if they are stationed here and, and the B-2s that come here, they're, they're all nuclear capable. Um, so that, this would be the first time that Australia would actually become a forward operations base for actual launch of um, nuclear weapons operations, uh, a pretty significant step for the country to take. But we're also increasing the ways in which we provide assistance through command and control, communications, targeting, um, and base basing and support uh, for nuclear operations. So at the moment, we're on a slippery slope that will make it increasingly difficult for Australia to, to join the treaty and be in compliance with it. And I think this it's a really urgent time for us to get active, and we really need to draw the line at nuclear weapons in Australia, um, but also ending our support um, for the, the supporting role that we currently play in enabling and assisting possible use of nuclear weapons that's clearly prohibited uh, by, by the, the TPNW. I'll stop there. Thanks very much. Thanks, Tilman. It was an enormous lot of information. I wonder if John and Aaron would like to make a short comment or a short addition to what Tillman has said. Um, there's enough information that we could spend the whole day together talking about this. I haven't seen many questions in the chat, more comments and agreement. I'll um, stop sharing too, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, John and Aaron, would you like to make uh, Aaron or Aaron first and then John a short comment on what Tillman has said? Oh, well, whoever wants to go first of you. It's faster on the draw. <laughs> um, yeah, um, I want to comment on one thing, uh, Hillman, and that is uh, you described the progression from stigmatization to prohibition uh, to elimination. Uh, and uh, the implication was that the prohibition uh, should be on the possession of nuclear weapons as well as other aspects. Um, but uh, historically, the progression has been on the prohibition of use and then the pro uh, and then elimination, um, certainly with weapons of mass destruction. Uh, and that was, I, I guess you didn't hear my talk, but my point was that we need to uh, learn from that and uh, we need to focus um, a good deal of our energy on the question of initiating nuclear war, that uh, that should that should be prohibited. Um, we now have a stigma, this, we, it has been stigmatized by the statements in Bali and New Delhi by the G20 that the use and threat of use of nuclear weapons is inadmissible. That's a very high level of stigmatization. Um, but then very quickly, um, uh, some Russian uh, spokespeople, including Putin, have um, not adhered to that, particularly the part about threatening. Uh, so that needs that needs work, and um, there is a logical reason why you're not going to make as much headway as you wish on uh, actual elimination and disarmament, as long as they see a practical use for nuclear weapons against a conventional threat. And that of course uh, makes no sense at all. It's a stupid policy, but it is one that is highly regarded within NATO, as I mentioned, as the glue of the alliance. And it's something that, it, that Japan genuflects to, Australia as well. And so um, we need to um, reallocate our efforts to um, give prominence to the question of initiating nuclear war as a policy. And um, that I believe strongly is one that we can win in the matter of years. Thanks, thanks, Aaron. That's, uh, that's my comment on that. Yeah, thanks. 
Um, John, uh, oh, John, would you like to make a short comment? Because we've got a question as well from yeah, yeah. one of our... Uh, well, just, um, I, I, I guess that um, Aaron and I have, I think, in many ways, led the charge on, um, on nuclear weapons use, or rather non-use, um, at, um, at various UN um, forums. So I mean, this is this is kind of what we've been um, what we've been doing with ourselves. It's certainly um, a major focus of um, of my own campaigning. Now, I think that um, not only are there many ways up the mountain, um, but it is not only possible but mandatory to go by all of the ways at once. In other words, that an approach that involves the TPNW, an approach that involves um, that in, that involves nuclear weapons use, posture and policy, um, both of these approaches are not in competition. Um, they're complementary and both need to happen at once. Um, now, 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 that said, I think that we are in a unique moment, though it's a hell of a prolonged moment of risk. And, um, and I think Tillman has been absolutely correct in focusing on that. Um, and I think that there is a need on the part of the um, of, of the disarmament movement as a whole, on the part of progressive movements as a whole, um, to grasp the nature of the risk that now confronts us. And I think Thanks, both John. Are John. Me that that's not happening. Thanks. Um, well, Tillman, if you can hang on, because we'll see what Colin has posted a lot in the chat, and especially about the no first use. What would you like to add to that, Colin? Uh, well, I just like to say yeah, um, that the no first use policies and the TPW should be going hand in hand. Um, we are just not going to make it to global nuclear disarmament if there's a nuclear war in the next uh, two or three decades. And uh, I don't think we're going to make it. We have to we have to hand in hand with the TPNW, which is a tremendous thing, because it shows the pathway towards the final solution, a global nuclear disarmament. We have to prevent ourselves from being wiped out with a in a nuclear war in the meantime. So why not the two of us, the two sides, the two um, two parts of this movement? Thanks. On the ban treaty and the and the policies work together. Thanks. Thanks, Colin. I think it's more. Amen. 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 Yeah. Uh, Tillman, would you like to respond to what Aaron and John and Colin has said? Is there any anything that you think stands out for you? And then we'll go to Rita's question. That's interesting. I don't know, if, Tillman, if you know about that, if there's a push to get local councils to sign to the TPNW. Uh, I can address both of those, um, if you like. Uh, so to, in terms of comments, yeah, look, I, you know, one thing we absolutely have to avoid is, you know, is arguing um, about things that are entirely consistent and complementary, um, you know. The, but from a campaigning perspective, and, you know, I think it is important that energy be focused. The TPNW is a very specific development you know, really trying to essentially learn the lessons of the landmines and cluster munitions campaigns, um, which did a remarkable thing, you know, in the space of less than a decade after years of stuffing around in the, in the, con um, the convention on certain uh, conventional weapons, um, you know, took a process offline of like-minded states to negotiate an ambitious treaty um, 
that was possible despite the opposition of the major users and producers of both those weapons and the, and the largest and most powerful states, Russia, China, the US, opposed those treaties, haven't signed them, but have been influenced by them. And, you know, use of landmines and production, the US doesn't produce either landmines or cost munitions at present. And except for during the Biden, uh, the Trump administration, you know, US officials go around UN meetings boasting their virtual compliance with the landmines ban, which they opposed and and and, and didn't join. Um, so treaties have an effect on states, you know, beyond just the legal obligations on those that join them. But the question that, you know, the, the sort of strategic question around the TPNW's genesis was, you know, what can the states who haven't got the weapons, only those who own them, unfortunately, can, can disarm, what can they do? You know, threatened by them uh, as much as anybody else, um, completely frustrated, frustrated by the many decades of delay in any clear disarmament action, and the obvious reality that none of the nine nuclear armed states are in any way serious about delivering on their obligation to disarm, care about what kind of logic is offered them. So the peace movement has often gets, I think, there's a risk of sort of co-option and being ineffectual if by treating this as a logical process uh, where, you know, we just have to come up with the right formula, the right prioritization of steps for the nuclear armed states to take and it will all fall into place. There's been an abundance. There's so much paper <laughs> being written on this and so much being said over many decades. Um, there's no shortage of steps that the nuclear armed states can perfectly logically take that they've committed to in various places at various times um, that don't go anywhere because they're fundamentally not interested. So for me, the key question about any measure is, um, you know, how if, how it can you can mobilise and campaign around it, um, and is it going to help eliminate nuclear weapons? Because in the end, while the weapons exist, there's a risk that they'll be used, whatever the specific articulated policies for the for their use are. The current reality is that is that states have weapons that are set up for for nuclear war fighting. Uh, they're not just about about deterrence. Um, exactly. So yeah, I, I'm not saying risk reduction is un, is unimportant, but I think the context um, is really uh, important. That uh, basically the nuclear armed states essentially have no interest, and we need to take great care uh, not to get co opted into you know, essentially ineffective games and processes through the NPT or other and other fora. I'd just like to... And, and about councils, yes, there is a... Um, there's One of the ICANN global campaigns is the city's appeal, so encouraging, um, you know, protection of citizens uh, is a key responsibility for all levels of government. Local government is responsible for many of the, the local services that would be um, ineffective if a nuclear war happened and would be key in terms of trying to to to, to help survivors. Um, and in Australia, there's now, I think, 48 cities that have joined, including just about all the capitals. Um, so I think that's a useful step in terms of public education, in terms of you know, democracy at work. Um, some of those councils have done good things. Pretty much all of them have written to um, leaders on both sides in Canberra to let them know of their position, urging them to join the treaty. Um, a number of them have done cultural or do regular cultural and educational activities. Uh, some of them have reviewed their own investments uh, with a view to divesting of any nuclear weapons uh, manufacturing investments that they have. Um, so yes, I think it's a useful thing to do. And the thing that, that they always respond to better than anything else is local residents um, asking them to do it. Thank you. Bob, you wanted to pose a question? Well, just a comment, really. Um, Aaron, um, in your opening uh, remarks, Aaron, you referred to uh, we've been spinning our wheels uh, for some time now. 
and I think that's an apt way of putting it. Um, but I'd, I'd suggest, and I, I would tend to agree with Tillman on this, that's not just a matter of having pursued um, a, um, a nominal goal, a treaty goal, or a, or a particular pathway of action that um, has been uh, uh, off target in any way. I think it's much more a matter of we've seen a generation and a half. Uh, it's been a generation and a half since uh, the last peak of the peace movement in Australia. And at that time, we had uh, the benefit of um, a good 15 years of uh, invested low-level activism and education by organisations like Friends of the Earth and the other anti-uranium uh, lobby organisations, the residue of the anti-war movement from the, from the Vietnam period and so forth. All of that contributed to a particular conjuncture in the 80s where we saw a real peak of our activity. Now enough people took their foot off the pedal since then that we've uh, become quite fragmented and we have been spinning our wheels not just on these treaty matters but on peace in general. But I would suggest that there's no easy way around that other than to re-engage in that public education process and that setting up an apparatus with a reasonable degree of consensus behind it that can engage in that is, is one of our highest priorities even more than picking the right path to pursue in terms of UN negotiations or lobbying. Thanks, Bob. And I would like to finish our session on a positive note. What can each of us do now to work towards nuclear disarmament? And John, if you would like to start, and then Aaron and then Tillman, what can each of us do? Just a sharp uh, piece of advice. What can we do? Well... I, I guess I would start by saying that to ask what is the right path is already the wrong question. Um, there isn't a single right path, but there are indeed quite a lot of useful things that people can do. Um, whether you're interested in risk reduction or whether you're interested in um, complete elimination, or whether, like me, you're interested in both and see them as mutually re reinforcing, um, the first thing to do is to write to your prime minister, your foreign minister, your minister of defence, and to say that the world is in danger, to say if you're in Australia, this is a geopolitical issue, um, for us here in Australia, for a whole variety of reasons, one of which is that we are going to be a nuclear target, um, and to suggest that this should actually be regarded as Australia's number one security issue um, and should be at the top of our defence, our diplomatic, our security, our national security policies. Thanks, John. Aaron, do you have a piece of advice for us in Australia? What can we do? Well, in Australia, there should be a hard look. Are you okay, John? Uh, there should be a hard look at what role uh, Australia would be expected to play um, if the United States was moving uh, towards uh, initiating the use of nuclear weapons, would Australia make efforts to block that? Are there things that, that can be done before the issue even arises that would make it possible for Australia to block that? Um, so, this is not, the question of no first use is not something just for the nuclear weapon states. It's also for the countries that are uh, on board with uh, the first use of nuclear weapons, uh, which Australia is because of its alliance relationship to the United States. So among the other things that you question about US policy, I would like to see a significant emphasis on this question of whether the US would get Australia's compliance 
complicity in the use of initiating the use of nuclear weapons. That is an argument that I think you can make tremendous headway with the public on if you articulate it clearly. And it would be a great contribution to the achievement of no first use or not initiating nuclear war um, on the global level. Thanks, Aaron. Tillman, last, you're last to give us some inspiration for what can we do? Yeah, I think there's a lot that that we can all do, and you know, this is this is an issue. Whatever our, whatever we're good at, whatever we care about, whatever we work on, you know, this this matters because everything we value and do, and all our goals are jeopardized by by the possibility of use of these horrible things wow. um, that we have no say over. I think I think learning and talking about it is 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 important. I think. Um, in your own context, there's some really simple things you can do in your own life. Make sure your super fund and your bank aren't among those that heavily fund uh, nuclear weapons producers. If they are, tell them that you don't like their policy and move to one that, that doesn't and tell them why. Um, if your local council hasn't signed up to the city's appeal, then go and talk to them and urge them to do so. Those, those are things that everybody can do in their own in, in their own um, area. I think both joining organizations that work on this, but also, you know, the many organizations that for whom this may not be their primary reason for being, but who have been in the past or could in the future be convinced that it should be part of their business, trade unions, churches, professional associations. Um, if they haven't said anything about nuclear weapons, urge them to, um, there's all sorts of things that 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 organisations can do, um, because the final common pathway for action on this has to be government. I think political pressure with on on parties and and on government and on your MP. If you haven't met your MP, go and see them. Um, see what their take is on these issues. See if they've signed ICANN's parliamentary pledge. Um, uh, you know, let them know very clearly wh where you stand on this. Um, I think those are some very practical things that, that, that we can all do. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, John and Aaron and Tillman, uh, for your input. As I said before, this is a very big topic and we could spend the whole day, if not two days, on it. And so we've done it in an hour and a half. Um, yeah, and go to the website of uh, ICANN and, and just keep on clicking. And the deeper you go into it, the more you learn, the more you find out. Um, so I uh, thank you both, the three of you, for contributing and thank you for our participants that you've uh, stayed with us. It's a tough topic, but it's you know essential for all of us to be informed and to know what we are doing. Aaron, you wanted to make a final uh, comment? I also would urge people to go to the No First Use Global website. Yeah. That's No First Use, one word, dot global. And also they might find interest in reading Aaron.tovish at medium.com. Uh, Can you quickly uh, put it in the chat? Where I've written uh, considerably on this subject. And as people for nuclear disarmament website. Yeah, I uh, haven't checked your website, so I wasn't sure. A, a, a lot of correspondence, well, um, both Vladimir Putin with Biden and with the UN General Assembly on these topics. I've just Thank added the No First Use website, so if yeah. anyone wants to visit it, it is just there. Oh, Colin has as well. Thank you, Colin. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. So uh, it's a big subject, but please inform yourself and see what you can do within your own organisations, within your own uh, sphere of influence. So thank you all very much. This is the end of, oh, it's right on the dot of five. Thank you very much for uh, sticking with us and uh, being part of uh, this webinar. The Raising Peace Festival continues. There are sessions happening uh, this evening uh, for the rest of the week. Some of them are uh, auspiced by other organizations, but we are uh, supporting them. So it's uh, yeah, raisingpeace.org.au. Go to the calendar and be part of more events, all in a lead up to the UN Day of Peace, the 21st of September. And I'm very 
heartened by the number of people, the number of organizations that want to be part of peace and of uh, raising the profile of peace. We need to talk about it. Um, sure. I see Madonna's online on the 21st of September. The Chanter mm -hmm. of Compassion has a fantastic webinar all day, and I can't attend it because I'm already committed to other peace initiatives. Uh, so there's a lot happening. Go to our calendar, and whatever you do, talk about peace in your local circles. Thank you, and uh, goodbye.